The United States is a republic. In fact, many countries are republics today. Ireland, France, India, Germany, and Italy, just to name a small fraction. Today, the definition of a republic is a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives, and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch. However, this definition fails to capture the historical importance of the idea of republics. The Enlightenment thinkers that would set the foundations that republics be built on today envisaged a reformation of political life as well as manners, liberty, personal virtue, and commerce. Today, republics are the norm, but this wasn't always the case. In fact, for most of human history, various forms of dictatorships and oligarchies have dominated over the rest of the population. But until America led the charge, there were very few practical examples of republics outside the grandiose republics of antiquity and the small city-states of contemporary Italy. In Europe, monarchy was the norm, a political system that held the highest cultural capital and sway. It would take years and years of philosophical argumentation and revolutionary movements before we arrive at the world of republics that we take for granted. During the 17th century in Europe, while most countries were centralized in their states into powerful monarchies, there was one shining glimpse of the potential of a republican form of government, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, or as it was commonly referred to, the Dutch Republic. In 1568, the seven provinces of the Netherlands united and signed the Union of Utrecht, starting rebellion against their ruler Philip II of Spain. After the lengthy and correctly named Eighty Years' War between the Netherlands and Spain in 1648, two treaties collectively known as the Peace of Westphalia brought an end to the conflict at last. Thus started the period spanning from 1588 to 1672 that is known by historians as the Dutch Golden Age, a period when the Dutch Republic, despite its demure size, became a powerhouse of trade, science, and literature. During a century where territorial, centralized monarchy was developing throughout Europe, the Dutch Republic looked quite out of place as a small, decentralized, and most importantly, commercial republic. The Dutch land and nobility held little sway in society. Instead, it was the urban merchant class that dominated. The Dutch sailed across the globe, and as a result, the Republic became a hotbed of commercial activity, and arguably one of the earliest examples of a broadly capitalist system, despite powerful monopolies such as the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch sailed not only to the New World of America, but also far east to trade with Japan and China. One could argue that during this Dutch Golden Age, the Netherlands was the most wealthy and scientifically advanced of the European powers, despite being minuscule in comparison to its neighbours. The wealth of the Republic attracted many immigrants, but this wasn't the only reason to visit the Republic. More than anywhere else at the time, the Dutch developed a climate of religious and intellectual tolerance. Many fled from religious persecution. One famous example is the Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza from Portugal. The freedom to speculate life's greatest questions without fear of inquisitors made the Dutch Republic a powerhouse of the book trade, where people like John Locke published the most radical works that most definitely would have been prohibited in any other European nation. This unprecedented climate of tolerance in the European world is called the Dutch miracle by modern historians. The Dutch were immensely proud of their republic and were strictly anti-monarchical. After all, their state was founded through conflict with a king. In 1664, one Englishman struck the nail on the head perfectly about the Dutch attitude. Tell them of monarchy but in jest, and they will cut your throat in earnest. They were republicans thick and thin, and thanks to the printing press and Dutch tolerance, there was an explosion of Dutch pamphleteers, many of whom praised and debated and discussed the virtues of a republic. But of the many writers, two brothers, Pieter and Johan de la Corte, stand out as the most ardently republican authors that, through their writings, helped inspire some of the most radical and modern elements of Enlightenment thinking. The brother's father, Pieter de la Corte Sr., was born in Ypres, located in the southern Netherlands. He settled in Leiden, one of Holland's largest towns, and through thrift and good sense, became a successful entrepreneur in the textile industry. His marriage to Jean de Planck allowed him to obtain citizenship rights in 1618, and in that same year, Pieter, the older of the Le Corte brothers, was born, followed four years later by his younger brother Johan in 1622. As the sons of a self-made man, the brothers would from an early age adopt a stance in favour of unrestricted immigration and economic liberty. Sadly, the De La Corte brothers were deemed outsiders due to their familial origins in the South. Later critics would insult them as garlic eaters, an insult hurled at anyone from the South. While not exactly the most scathing of insults, 
It will help solidify the brothers' belief that from birth, they are outsiders, even in the nation they were born. The economic success of their father allowed the De La Corp brothers to enjoy the finest fruits of a humanistic education. And if there was ever a place to raise two intellectuals, it was Leiden, a bulwark of humanist scholarship and thought. The younger of the two, Johann, was convinced by his father to become a preacher, and by the fall of 1641, he is enrolled at Leiden as a university student of theology. While Johann was studying, the older Pieter embarked on a grand tour, a kind of extended study trip that was considered an essential element of a true humanist education. For the next two years, Pieter would visit England, France, Switzerland, and Germany, keeping a diary recording his observations. While in England, Pieter was particularly appalled by the behaviour of the then reigning monarch Charles I, strengthening his belief in the virtues of a republic. While in France, he met with theologians and scholars who greatly influenced his belief in religious toleration. Throughout his diary, Pieter shows an aptitude for practical thinking. After returning from his grand tour in the fall of 1643, Pieter joined his younger brother Johann at the University of Leiden, following his footsteps as a student of theology. While attending university, Johann and Pieter studied classical rhetoric, classical languages, history and philosophy, amongst a distinctly international population of students and professors. The brothers were also undertaking their studies at a pivotal period, as during the first half of the 17th century, politics became its own independent academic discipline, its own kind of methodology. With the discovery of the New World and the rising importance of commerce, European society had begun a process of dramatically changing as the formerly established worldview of the medieval ages crumbled. The 17th century was a mess of various views and ideas about politics, religion and science, and the Dutch Republic, De La Corp brothers were free to speculate without fear of reprisals. When Johann graduated in 1645, like Pieter, he embarked on his own grand tour to Geneva. In their mid-twenties, by 1650, the De La Corp brothers entered their father's line of work as partners and establish a cloth trading firm that would become one of the most prominent firms in Leiden, despite being called garlic eaters from time to time due to their immigrant backgrounds. But despite this label, as successful entrepreneurs, the De La Corp brothers began to rub elbows with the elite of Holland. Pieter became close friends with a member of Leiden's governing council, Johann Elman, an especially advantageous ally as he was a relative of Johann de Witt, one of the leading figures of the Dutch Republic until 1672. By 1657, Pieter married Elman's sister-in-law, but sadly, the marriage did not last long, as his wife tragically died one year later in childbirth. Though Pieter would remarry in 1661 to Catherine van der Voort, the sister of two wealthy Amsterdam merchants, another relative of Johann de Witt. During the 1650s, the brothers were emboldened by their economic success and penetration into the elite strata of Dutch society. Pieter and Johann began to contemplate a life beyond business. The perfect catalyst for entry into political life came when William II, Prince of Orange and Stadtholder, died of smallpox, with his only heir being William III, who was born only a week after his death. Since its separation from Spain, the Dutch Republic was composed of provincial and general assemblies that governed in tandem with a Stadtholder. The Stadtholder's main duties were military affairs, and each province was led by the position of a Stadtholder. In theory, this position was open to any eligible citizen. However, in practice, this was not the case. William the Silent, the leader of the Dutch revolt against the Spanish, had been appointed stadtholder in Holland, the first province to rebel, and thanks to his grand reputation and influence, the position of stadtholder was in reality passed down through the Orange family line. Though they were no monarchs, this was a hereditary position of power that made advocates of republics like the De La Corp brothers very wary. But when William II left no eligible successor, the five leading Dutch provinces did not appoint a replacement, leading to what is now known as the stadtholderless period the perfect time for the De La Corp brothers to bring a vision of a commercial republic that embodied true liberty to the forefront of Dutch politics. In 1654, Johann began to spend his spare time thinking and writing about politics in private. Pieter once wrote that, once successful enough, Johann no longer saw any need to spend the bulk of his time attending to business. Instead of spending his money lavishly or wasting time idle, Pieter wrote that Johann spent his days studying without hate, love, fear and hope sincerely his inner thoughts of all occurring political and moral matters on paper. After a few very productive years of writing, Johann fell ill, and fearing for the worst, in 1660, Johann gave Pieter his blessing to take control of his property, both physical and intellectual, if he succumbed to illness. Only a month later, Johann died, 
leaving Pieter heartbroken at the loss of both his wife and brother in the span of a few years. Looking for a distraction from his grief, Pieter plunged himself into publishing and editing his beloved brother's writings. Though Johann wished for his unpublished manuscripts to remain unpublished, Pieter defied this wish in 1660, publishing an edition of Johann's papers that collectively form what is called Considerations and Examples of State Concerning the Foundations of All Sorts of Governments. Not the coolest title. Given that this work was Johann's private thoughts not meant to be published, the work held no punches, and Pieter knew this. He published the book under a fake editorial name, VH, an acronym for Van Hove, the Dutch translation of De La Corte. This first collective work of the De La Corte brothers centered around debating which of the three traditional forms of government was best between monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. The next year, Pieter prepared a second edition under a new title, Considerations of State, or Political Balance. Pieter added 100 pages of additional content, while also adjusting and modifying the original text a bit. Pieter spent the bulk of 1662 around publishers and books, publishing six different editions of Consideration of the State or Political Balance, while simultaneously publishing 15 editions of three other books. One manuscript entitled Comments on the Welfare and Interest, the City of Leiden, though not published, copies were circulated among the elites of Leiden, and as a result, Pieter attracted the attention and patronage of Johann de Witt. From this point on, Pieter extended the writings of his brother into a fully-fledged political campaign. From here on in, I will refer to the writings and ideas of the brothers simply as de la Corte. We can't be fully sure of who wrote what, so it's easiest to merge them into one personality as de la Corte, just for simplicity's sake. Thanks to high levels of literacy and vernacular publishing, large numbers of normal people began to take part and form themselves in the debates of the day. De la Corte was well aware of this trend and wrote in a style that appeared to the ordinary man, with jokes, fable-like stories, and vernacular language. Despite De La Corte's level of education, they wanted to reach the judgment of all modest readers, to help raise the speculation of thoughts of those who have any share in government in my free fatherland. De La Corte did something quite extraordinary for political writing. He made it understandable to the everyday person, while also still appealing to the elite and educated. De La Corte's works quickly became bestsellers, with Interest of Holland in the year 1662 being reprinted eight times with constant revisions and additions, and that's only one year. De La Corte was both reviled and loved at the same time. Their works were reprinted numerous times, yes, and it was very common to spot someone at a street corner flicking through something by De La Corte. But on the other end, some leaps were deeply perturbed by the supposed vulgarity of De La Corte, but more egregiously, the crime of bringing knowledge to the masses. Who knows what they'd do? But what ideas were so radical yet so popular? It's quite hard to summarize De La Corte's work in a traditional way, by going step by step through each book they published. De La Corte's writings are lively and enjoyable, but this enthusiasm leads to a highly unsystematic appearance. The De La Corte brothers both lamented that their time at school was wasted with abstract subjects, writing, Can one think of anything more ridiculous and more capable to extinguish all human wisdom than philosophy? as has been taught all over Europe and is still taught in many academia. De La Corte believed that temporary academic approaches reeked of armchair philosophy. Condemning such speculatory and utopian work, De La Corte wrote that their ideas are nothing more than a philosophical republic in the air. So yes, De La Corte is quite unsystematic, but there was a point to it. De La Corte wanted to give general rules, not a hardcore, full, described system that would never exist in reality. So to best summarize De La Corte's ideas, I'm going to focus on three big interrelated ideas that pervade all of De La Corte's work. Anti-monarchism, economic liberty, and true liberty. De La Corte, unlike many contemporaries who had a gloomy view of democracy, welcomed widespread political participation. Though not widespread enough to include women or men without property, De La Corte was still deemed a dangerous radical at the time. The greatest fear for De La Corte was not the rabble in the streets, but those who call themselves monarchs and palaces. De La Corte's definition of monarchy was quite simple. It is a form of government where one person rules and all the others obey. The greatest threat to the Republic, therefore, was the return of the Stadtholder as the closest thing the Dutch had to a monarchical figure. De La Corte's argument against monarchy begins with an idea of human nature. All people are naturally self-interested and follow what De La Corte called their passions. 
Now, you might say the meaning of passion today is like someone's very passionate about music, but back in De La Corte's day, passion denoted ambitious, greedy, or even tyrannical behavior, unmoored by reason or care for others. And these passions are inherent in all people. De La Corte wrote, The passions are in first possession, and those who pay attention will realize they also stick with man until the very end of his life. For De La Corte, humans are needy and vulnerable creatures that are driven by strong passions and natural drive. Above all others, self-love. Now, to some degree, human passion could, through good education, reasoning, experience, be quelled. But when push comes to shove, necessity always triumphs over cherished principles. Delacorte wrote, For reason and virtue can do no more than to give advice, whereas necessity forces. It breaks, as the saying goes, both laws and iron. The real counter to passion and self-love is fear of punishment. What De La Corte grimly believed was the cornerstone of civil society. Without the rule of law, the worst of human passions reared its head, the desire to dominate others. Humans are not demons, but they are not saints either. De La Corte believed any form of government balanced upon personal virtue is bound to topple over eventually when necessity strikes. Monarchists could argue back that kings were very well educated, and this could control their passions better than the common rabble. But Delacorte saw through this, reminding his readers that no man and his descendants could ever possibly rule over a population for eternity. But tackling education, Delacorte explained future kings were often kept ignorant, so they would not rise up at the first chance they had to steal the throne. The reality that Delacorte witnessed himself was that most monarchs' education consisted of dancing, feasts, and hunting excessively. But the worst aspect of monarchy of all was that even if a great king is in power, there is still uncertainty. Unlike the rest of society, a king was described by De La Corte as living above all laws and political orders. Thus, they had absolute power and could change their mind on a whim. The law could change the snap of a finger, and nothing could be done. The king is the law, Rex is Lex. Monarchy, even at its best, caused citizens to constantly cross their fingers that the king's mood didn't pivot in a sour direction. The only reason De La Corte believes monarchy was ever preferred to republics is because of propaganda. Monarchs hate bad press, and so anything critical of them in history was scrubbed from the record, leaving them looking an awful lot better than they actually were in life. While republics had free speech, this allowed for every citizen to voice their concerns, regardless of their feelings in the leader. Delacorte was especially disgusted by his contemporaries' love of figures like Augustus and Caesar, writing, Those horrible monsters are still praised by most historians, as if they'd been very pious heroes. The next big idea of De La Corte's work is economic liberty, an idea you don't really hear about too often before the Enlightenment. But growing up in the commercial hub of the Western world, De La Corte saw the value of commerce, but also saw the value of leaving commerce free from undue state interference. English Republican thinkers looked to the example of Rome, which sickened De La Corte, who argued Rome was utterly founded on violence of arms to the ruin of all learning and commerce. It sickened De La Corte that this murderer's den, this wolf's nest, this most detestable and horrible public that's ever been on earth is praised by so many. Thinkers like Machiavelli from Florence and Algernon Sidney from England argue that a good Republican state ought to increase its greatness by acquiring more territory following the model that Romans laid down. But De La Corte explained that true path to greatness was not war, but prosperity, and prosperity through free trade. The Greek city-state of Athens represented what the Dutch ought to emulate, a thriving commercial city that welcomed foreigners and allowed economic activity without patents, privileges, guilds, or halls. De La Corte adopted Cicero's popularly used phrase, Salus Populi Suprema Lex Esto, let the welfare of the people be the ultimate law. This is also the state motto of Missouri, I will never not say that. Now, this is a generic enough idea that appeals to all kinds of thinkers, both Republican and monarchist. But De La Corte argued that this phrase is like a nice doll, praised by all outwardly, only valued by a few and cared for inwardly. The De La Corte brothers' time in Leiden showed that true greatness is not to be found in war, but in everyday prosperity, which commerce and economic liberty can bring to the populace. Though humans are driven by selfish passions, these passions are actually quite useful. Self-interested beings will make smart decisions that, through commercial activity, serve the wants and needs of others at ever-decreasing costs. Though for some it might be tempting to try and regulate industries, De La Corte believed individuals knew their own situation best, writing, He who has to eat the porridge, cooks it and cools it best. 
Most importantly, competition stimulates this activity. De La Court quipped that competition makes an old wife trot, hunger makes beans sweet, and poverty begets ingenuity. At a more fundamental level beyond economics though, De La Court believed everyone ought to be totally free and unrestrained in producing and dealing with his own commodity. Where everyone takes care of himself, everyone is fine, and no one gets lost. This is the natural liberty that rulers should never take away from their subjects. A lesson all too often forgotten today. Along these lines, De La Court argued for pervasive yet practical economic policies, including unrestricted immigration, abolishing guilds, and low taxes. De La Court's advice was simple. Persist with liberty, otherwise the industries will divert. The third big idea of De La Court's oeuvre is true liberty. Now, every author talks about true liberty and that they've got the right definition. De La Court emphasized that all good political thinkers will admit that the highest perfection of politics and human society consists in this single point, namely, that subjects are left as much natural liberty in any way doable. Basically, leave people as free as you possibly can. De La Court argued that though we are bound by laws, the law has limits and can't really do whatever it pleases. De La Court expressed in kind of a cosmopolitan way, we are humans by nature, only by coincidence are we members of a society or republic. Our rights could not be placed behind the law. Rights came first. This all sounds pretty standard for libertarians. De La Court sounds like he's talking about negative freedom, the idea that freedom is freedom from other people interfering with your activities. But there is more to true liberty than merely negation. De La Court's true liberty was best embodied in the ancient republics. This lengthy quotation, where no one is bound to live according to the will and desire of one man, but to the spirit of order and law, and all inhabitants of that state are uniformly subject to the law. To put that in less fancy language, in the ideal state, there are no masters and there are no slaves. No one can dominate another. Liberty is more than not just being bothered by other people. It is having concrete assurance that the rule of law, that no citizen will ever suffer arbitrary whims of a ruler, but instead, get the same law applied to both nobles and paupers. The Roman historian Livy had a good phrase for this. He said, an empire of laws, not of men. The idea of taking the personal will of rulers away and replacing it with the law. De La Court has a lovely little story about a determined goldfinch that escapes his birdcage, then confronts his owner saying, I could not live according to my own will, that all my happiness or unhappiness depended on continuously on your care or carelessness. The program of De La Court was not about getting the right person into power, but making sure whomever was in power was not a master of slaves, but a servant of the people bound by strict laws and the limits of natural liberty. Sounding very much like a modern-day libertarian or anarchist, De La Court wrote, We must not take away the name king, but the thing king. Sadly, Pieter de la Court's prolific publishing was disrupted when the Staterlos period came to an end, and true liberty seemed to be out of sight. Pieter, being aligned with a radical wing of republicanism, was ousted from Holland by his political enemies, who re-established a stadtholder in 1672. After his patron Johan de Witt was lynched by a mob, Pieter fled to Antwerp, where he stayed with his brother-in-law. Though he returned to the Dutch Republic a year later, he was perturbed by gruesome death threats. He wouldn't make his views public again until 1669, when he had his last work published. Pieter lived in Amsterdam, dying peacefully in 1685. Though Pieter and Johan de la Court left a sizable body of work behind, history hasn't been so kind to the brothers. Their names don't exactly crop up very often in histories of political philosophy or theory. But scholars like Jonathan Israel have made the case that the free market and free voting radical sect of Enlightenment thought was deeply indebted to the De La Corp brothers. After their deaths, the works of the De La Corp brothers were commonly read in France, Germany, and England. Anne Robert Jacques Tugot, a physiocrat and early advocate of laissez-faire economics, closely studied De La Corp. And across the channel, another pivotal economic thinker, Adam Smith, owned copies of De La Corp's works as well. Chiming in as a fellow Dutchman, Bernard Mandeville also followed De La Corte's teachings. The radical aspects of De La Corte's anti-monarchist stances were usually ignored. 
but their arguments for economic liberty played a surprisingly large role in creating the environment and culture of commerce that we live in today. Thanks a mil for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Portraits of Liberty is written and hosted by me, Paul Meany, and produced by Landry Ayers. You can also visit libertarianism.org to find more shows like this. I hope to see you next time.